The Commission pleases, we have one more witness to call in relation to the home loan part of this block of hearings. That witness is Mr William Rankin. Yes. Mr Rankin, would you come into the witness box please? This box please. Mr Rankin, would you prefer to take an oath or would you wish to make an affirmation? Uh, affirmation. So affirm the witness please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Mr. Rankin. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Collins. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Um, would you state your full name? Uh, William Andrew Rankin. And is your business address 833 Collins Street, Docklands? Yes, it is. Uh, and are you the lead of the homeowners team at the ANZ Banking Group? Yes, I am. Um, Mr Rankin, have you received a summons to appear before the Commission? Yes, I have. And do you have that with you in the witness box? Yes, I do. Would you hand that to the uh, assistant, Your Honour, I tender the summons? Yes, that will be uh, Exhibit 1.85, summons to... Mr Rankin. And Mr Rankin, have you made a witness statement for the purpose of these Royal Commission hearings? Yes, I have. And do you have a copy of that with you in the witness statement? Yes, I do. Uh, and uh, your uh, Commissioner, I tender the witness statement. Oh, sorry, before I do that, um, is there a correction, Mr Rankin, to be made to the witness statement on page 11 in paragraph 59, Roman B, sorry, little b, Roman 6? Uh, yes, there is. And is the correction to delete the last two words of that subparagraph and superannuation? Yes, it is. And with that correction, Mr Rankin, are the contents of your statement true and correct? Yes, they are. And Commissioner, I tender the uh, witness statement. Mr Rankin, have you been good enough to strike through the words that you wanted yes. corrected and initial those? Oh, yes. Just initial oh, them, if you would. Thank you very much. Exhibit 1.86, witness statement of Mr uh, William Andrew Rankin. No questions. Yes, yes, Ms. Hall. <coughs> Mr Rankin, you're responsible for ANZ's home loan portfolio, is that right? Yes, it is. Uh, and you estimate that that portfolio is currently estimated as being a $265 billion portfolio? Approximately, yes. Yes. Now, uh, could I ask you to turn to the first exhibit to your witness statement, Mr Rankin, uh, which is ANZ 800 314 0001. Hi. And could we have the first and second pages of this document displayed on the screen, please? This is an extract of ANZ's 2017 full year results. Yes, it is. And we see from that that in FY17, ANZ had approximately 1.008 million home loan accounts. That's correct. Uh, and this represents an approximately 15.7% share of the home loan market. Uh, that's correct. And the average loan size was $262,000. Yes. And the average loan to value to value ratio at initiation was 69%. Yes. Could you explain the loan to value ratio, Mr. Rankin? Uh, the loan to value ratio is a mathematical figure taken when you um, uh, compare the size of the loan against the value of the underlying asset. Thank you. <clears throat> now. ANZ offers home loans through five channels, is that right? Uh, yes. And those channels include a broker distribution channel? Yes. <clears throat> and the proportion of, <clears throat> excuse me, the proportion of ANZ home loans that originate from brokers is significant, do you agree? Yes. Um, <clears throat> can I take you to the table at paragraph 42 of your statement? <clears throat>
If we could have that page and the following page displayed on the screen, please. You include tables in paragraphs 42 and 43 of your witness statement. And from the first table, do we see that during the period from 1 October 2016 to 30 September 2017, 177,604 home loan applications were submitted to ANZ? Uh, I'm sorry, no. I, I have that figure wrong. Could you explain how many home loans were submitted to ANZ in that period? Sorry, no, is this the, your wording around applications submitted? That, that's actually um, approved sales. I see. Yes. So this isn't just submitted, these are the home loans that went through um, to approval. Is that right? That is my understanding, yes. Yes, I see. And of those, approximately 102,000 were submitted by brokers? Yes. A approved, but submitted by brokers? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. So that's 58% that were submitted by brokers that went through to approval? Yes. Uh, and the quantum of home loan sales submitted by brokers was also significant? That's what you deal with in your table in paragraph 14? Yes. I'm sorry, paragraph 43. We see from that table that during that same period from 1 October 2016 to 30 September 2017, ANZ sold approximately $67 billion of home loans. Yes. And of that amount, almost $38 billion came from brokers. Yes. So 56% of the sales during that period. Yes. Um, you explain in your statement that ANZ's procedures for processing and approving home loans originated by brokers are generally the same as for home loans that come through the non-broker channels? Yes. But you mentioned one difference, well you mentioned that one difference is that as at March 2017, all broker initiated home loan applications were subject to manual assessment? That's correct. Is that still the case? That is still the case, yes. And is that because they're not processed through your internal um, mortgage origination system platform? Uh, it, they, have a, they have their own specific mortgage origination platform um, and we think it's prudent that we should manually assess um, those applications. Why do you think it's prudent to do that, Mr Rankin? Um, because our um, bank staff aren't uh, at the initial um, conversation with the customer and so um, we're relying on the broker to submit um, documents um, so we like to manually look at those. Is the process for uh, broker originated home loans still partially automated? Uh, yes. In what way? What part of it is automated? Um, the uh, the assessment of the the, um, the automated part is where we look for the credit score by um, getting a query to the credit uh, the um, uh, it's VADA or um, Equifax the um, bureaus credit bureaus. Yes. So that portion is automated. Any other that portion, portion automated? automated. Um, the, the system would automate the sensitisation of the actual payments, mm -hmm. um, so some of those mathematical calculations would be automated as well. Yes. Yes. I see. Could I ask you some questions about the steps that ANZ requires a broker to take when submitting a home loan to ANZ? Um, you've annexed to your statement a document called the ANZ Broker Operations Manual. Uh, that's the second exhibit to your statement, ANZ 800 314 0003. Um, and you explain in your statement that this document sets out ANZ's expectations in relation to any home loan application submitted by a broker, is that right? Yes. Uh, and this document we see is dated November 2016. Yes. Is it still current, this document? I believe so, yes. Okay. And could I ask you to look at 0048 in this document?
And we see there under the heading lending criteria, 5.1 income verification. Do you see that, Mr Rankin? Yes. ANZ will only lend to borrowers who can demonstrate an ability to repay with sufficient comfort and over the life of the loan. Yes. And could you explain what is meant by with sufficient comfort in this setting? Uh, we look at um, a calculation around unencumbered monthly income. Um, and if that unencumbered monthly income, when we assess um, the repayment requirements on a fully sensitised basis, um, if that is positive, then that's deemed sufficient comfort. Yes, I see. Before submitting a home loan application, a broker is required to conduct a loan interview with the potential borrower, is that right? Yes, it is. And are there requirements about how that loan interview is to be conducted? Yes, there are. Could I ask you to look at uh, 0073 in this document? See there 6.3 loan interview? Yes. And 6.3.1 purpose of the loan interview? Yes. And I'd ask you to look at 6.3.2 during the loan interview. The loan interview must be conducted in person by the NADA who has been accredited by uh, ANZ and not by any other person. As an approved originator, you are required to be satisfied as to the customer's ability to service their commitments, i.e. get to know your customer and to ensure that the product offered meets the customer's requirements and objectives. So we see from that that the broker has to be satisfied as to the customer's ability to service their commitments. Yes. And does ANZ have an independent obligation to satisfy itself as to the customer's ability to service their commitments? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, we do. Yes, and you're aware that that's a legal obligation that arises under the National Credit Act? Yes. Uh, and can ANZ discharge that obligation by relying on the broker's assessment of whether the customer has the ability to service the commitments? I'm not aware that we can, no. Mm -hmm. So you accept that you have an independent uh, obligation uh, to assess whether the customer has the ability to service their commitments yourself? Yes. Thank you. And as at March 2017, a broker was required to submit three forms of documents to ANZ, is that right? Uh, specifically three, I'm not sure. Uh, if, if it assists, I'll direct you to paragraph 48 of your statement. Do you see there, Mr Rankin, a reference to three documents, a completed online home loan application form, a statement of financial position signed by the customer and supporting documentation? Yes, yeah, so when you said three, support, yeah, so when you said three, supporting documentation could be many. I was wondering why oh, you limited sorry. to three. Oh, I'm sorry. So that, that could be a bundle of yes. documents. Yes. yes. So three, well, Components. Uh, two individual two individuals documents and, then and one bundle of documents, yes. which is the supporting documentation. Yes. And is that still the case, that brokers are required to submit that documentation to ANZ? Yes. And the first two of those documents, the online home loan application form and the statement of financial position, they're completed by the broker with information that's to be collected by the broker from the customer? That's correct. Uh, and the statement of financial position, the second document, is to be signed by both the broker and the customer? That's correct. All right. Now, uh, could we move then to the steps that ANZ takes, having received these, uh, the two documents and the third set of documents from the broker? The documents are entered into ANZ's internal system and the assessment process commences, is that right? Uh, the details are uh, entered into already entered into with the online home loan application form by the broker yes they then pass through to ANZ systems via various gateways and yes things. you deal with this in paragraph 52 of your statement so the information's received into uh, what you've described as MOS which is ANZ's mortgage origination system yes uh, and then 
uh, the assessment process commences, which you explain involves a combination of automated functions and manual assessment by a member of the ANZ assessments team. That's correct. Is that still the case? That is still the case, yes. Yes. Now, the automated component of the process <coughs> includes the steps you've described in paragraph 53 of your statement. Yes. Uh, I see you've used the word including there in paragraph 53. Uh, were there any other steps to the automated component of the process that you did not refer to in your statement? Uh, no, I think that's fairly comprehensive. There, I need. To, there's one other adjustment to expenses, which is if a customer claims to be living at home rent free, that we would then um, insert a minimum board board amount. And that's an automated step, is it? I'm, I'm not sure. It's only. I'm not sure if that's automated or. Um, manual right. in the MOZ system. So that's, that's, that's the only reason. Other than that, I can't think of any other reason. Okay. Yeah. And the steps that you've referred to here as comprising the automated process as at March 2017 are still the steps within the automated process? Uh, that's correct at the point of assessment, yes. Yes. And the steps that you described there include uh, in 53B, the initial calculation of uncommitted monthly income, or UMI. Yes. And the UMI in general terms is the amount of money available to the customer after all monthly expenses have been deducted from their net monthly income? Uh, um, so a, an estimate of expenses on a monthly basis. So because some expenses obviously are annual and you need to take a, they might be paid annually, but you need to take a monthly adjustment. So with that qualification then, do you agree that it's the amount of money available to the customer after all estimated monthly expenses have been deducted from their net monthly income? Uh, in, yes, including um, uh, buffers to those expenses yes. from what they currently are today. Yes. Um, buffers applied by yeah. ANZ? Buffers applied by ANZ, yes. Thank you. And you explain here that the UMI figure incorporates the monthly home loan repayments, a monthly repayment figure for the customer's credit cards, which is calculated as 3% of the customer's total credit card limit. Yes. Uh, and it also uh, incorporates the higher of the customer's stated living expenses or a particular living expenses benchmark used by ANZ. Uh, known as the Household Expenditure Measure or HEM benchmark. That's right? Yes. Oh, a benchmark. But you also say in 53C that in some cases, the steps also include the calculation of a loan to value ratio. In which cases is a loan to value ratio calculated? Uh, it's more, I think that in some cases it's on the modelled estimate of the value being appropriate. So, mm -hmm. um, if the, um, the uh, stated value of that house is within a range that is uh, our, um, our systems tell us is within the reasonable range for a house of that type, that nature, and there's no other reasons why we would require a full or curbside valuation of that thing, then we're happy to take the modelled estimate. If we've got a modelled estimate, then we can calculate an LVR off the back of that. I see, but sometimes you don't use the modelled estimate, is that what you're saying? You Correct. calculate it specifically. Sorry? You do a specific calculation rather than relying on the model. No, it's not is the calculation, it's the, um, sorry, it's not the yes. calculation, it's the, um, where, where we're happy to actually rely on that valuation, the valuation component, which allows us to do the calculation. Um, sometimes if the value that's given to us seems out of whack with values of the houses of that nature in that suburb, we'd say, sorry, we need a full valuation. We wouldn't do an LVR based on the estimate you've given us. So does that mean that an LVR is always done rather than only done? Um, it's a question of what it's based on, the valuation that's accepted or another one that's uh, we, required? We would always do an LVR to approve a loan. Yes. Um, at this stage, is it, if it's an automated calculation, depends actually if whether we're happy to rely on the automated I valuation. See. I see. Thank you. 
You then deal in paragraph 54 with the key Before steps... Before we that leave <coughs> the calculation of the UMI, can I just make sure I understand 53B2 to the uh, uh, credit card uh, allowance? Assume you have a uh, an applicant for a mortgage who has a credit card limit of $5,000. You take to account uh, a repayment of 150 a month, do you? Uh, yeah, that, that um, sensitisation of the credit card repayment is assuming um, the full limit is used on the facility. So the customer's maxed out the credit card yes. and you're assuming the customer is going to service that at 150 a month. Uh, that is at 1800 a year on a 5000 credit card debt. Is that right? Uh, that's right. It, it's calculated to assume that they pay it down within five years. Well, uh, th it's exactly that I wanted to uh, focus on, on the numbers as I understand them, at least. Uh, would 1800 a year pay down a 5000 credit card debt that's accruing interest? Uh, that's the calculation that the systems use. Um, yeah, that, that's I know my, that's, that's my what understanding. the system does. What, I, what I'm trying to get my head round, and forgive my uh, probably deficient mathematical grasp of it, but it seemed to me that uh, if the customer was going to make any headway on that credit card debt, it was going to be uh, quite slow uh, headway on the debt. But am I right or wrong? Uh, I, I think five years is actually the time, the time frame it would be paid down using that I ratio. See. Yeah. What's credit card interest rate at the moment? On most of your cards, what's the rate? I actually, I actually, I'm not a, I don't know the credit card rates. There's a range, I think there's... You pay it off as soon as it comes in, like some others do. Absolutely. In yes. <laughs> not everybody does. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, Ms Orr, do go on. No, Commissioner. I, I wanted to move to component of the assessment process, which you deal with in paragraph 54 of your statement. And again, you say that you've listed the key steps, which include the 11 steps listed in paragraph 14. Uh, are there any other steps? I'm sorry, sorry. In, in paragraph 54. Right. So I'm in paragraph 54. You say that the key steps of the manual component of the assessment process include A to K. So there are 11 key steps. Uh, yes. And are there any other steps in addition to those 11 that you've listed there? Uh, if there are, um, I, I couldn't definitely say there are no others. If there's uh, refer out rules that the system picks up in terms of the application, the assessor would be required to answer those refer out rules and satisfy themselves as to why the loan should keep going through. So I think there's a, um, they're, the, they're the key ones. So the, the, that sort of step that you've described is on the margins, is it? That only happens in some cases and these are the key steps that should occur in each instance of um, manual assessment? These are, yes, yes. Okay, and are these still the steps that ANZ takes in its manual component of the assessment process? Yes, they are. And one of the steps that you've referred to in 54C is a review of the application against the customer's signed statement of financial position to check if the customer's financial information has been correctly recorded by the broker in the application. You see that? Yes. Uh, and another is the verification of the customer's income, this is 54D, as stated in the signed statement of financial position using the documentation provided by the broker. Yes. Yes. Could I take you to your third exhibit, which is ANZ's, ANZ's mortgage credit requirement policy, ANZ 800 282 0001. Now, this document sets out ANZ's credit requirements in relation to home loans. Yes. And is it still current, Mr Rankin? Uh, I believe if it is, it, actually there might be some minor, I, I don't, I'd need to check that. We do um, update and review aspects to the requirements, I'm not sure. Okay. So ANZ employees are required to follow this policy? 
Uh, yes, they are. Yes. Within so there's it's a it's a strict policy, and yes. then um, our assessors have a credit authority discretion, and they can um, uh, make sort of overrides um, to that policy if um, it's within the discretion and it's deemed reasonable. Yes, I see. But in the absence of an override, this sets out the, requi yes. the credit requirements that are to be followed? Yes, it does. Okay. Could I ask you to look at 0070? And could we have uh, 0070 and 0071 on the screen together, please? Do you see there... Uh, Mr. Rankin, 5.4 other income sources. Uh, yes. So ANZ recognises in this document that customers may have a variety of sources of income. Yes. And one of those sources is government benefits. Yes. And at uh, 0072. We see the way this document deals with government benefits. Uh, down the bottom of the page, government income sources, government benefits may be used in servicing calculations on a limited basis as they are designed to provide a very basic standard of living. Government benefits are split into three categories, benefits that may comprise the applicant's total income, i.e. benefit can be the sole source of the applicant's income, government benefits that must comprise less than 50% of the applicant's total income and can be accepted on a case-by-case -case basis, i.e. the applicant must have other income aside from government benefits, we'll see over the page. And three, the third form is government benefits that are unacceptable. You see that? Yes. Uh, so we see from the table on this page that a pension is a government benefit that is permitted by ANZ to comprise the customer's total income? That is correct. Yes. And this form of income is to be verified by a letter from Centrelink within 60 days of the date on the signed statement of position that confirms ongoing payments or a three-month transaction history from the customer's bank account showing consistent payments over that three-month period. That's correct. Yes, so those are ANZ's requirements in relation to uh, verification of income that comes as a government pension. Correct. Thank you. Now, could I uh, return to your statement at 54, back into the steps that you've listed of the manual process? Now, there is no reference in any of the 11 steps that you've identified in paragraph 54 to verifying the customer's expenses. Is that right? Uh, 54. Customer's income. That's, that's correct. And that's because that wasn't part of the process and isn't part of the process at ANZ. The only uh, reference we see to something along those lines is in 54F, verification of the customer's ANZ home loan, personal loan, credit card and overdraft liabilities. The assessor would also verify any other financial institution liabilities which were being refinanced as part of the loan application. So a very limited form of verification restricted to ANZ loan products or other financial institution liabilities that are being re refinanced within the loan application. Um, that's correct, although at H, um, that wording confirmation of the hire of the customer's stated living expenses, we, we um, see reference to the HEM benchmark as a form of indirect verification. Could you explain that? How, how does the HEM benchmark, how does moving from away from the customer's declared expenses to the HEM benchmark verify the expenses declared by the customer in the information provided by the broker? Yeah, it's a, it's a form of what we refer to as indirect verification. Um, if the customer's um, had the conversation with the broker and they've gone through components of their um, 
uh, living expenses mm -hmm. and said, here's my total, we then indirectly verify if that is reasonable by reference to a benchmark such that if the customer has stated it's say $1,000 and the benchmark for a customer of in that sort of um, that number of dependents and whether they're single or a couple, et cetera, is below that, we would apply the higher mm -hmm. benchmark level. Well, I, I want to suggest to you, Mr Rankin, that that is not a verification step at all. That is not about verifying what the customer has told the broker about their expenses. It's instead connected to the suitability assessment because in some cases you don't accept the customer's declared expenses, you move them up to the HEM benchmark for the purposes of assessing suitability for the loan, but you do nothing to verify the expenses that uh, are recorded by the broker in the documentation uh, provided to ANZ. Um, other than to ensure that the um, statement as to what those living expenses are is also signed by the customer. We don't verify yes. beyond that. So all that the ANZ employee does is check that the expenses recorded in the application are the same as those recorded in the statement of financial position. There's a cross check between those two documents. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, and you would agree that that's not a verification of the information contained in the statement of financial position provided by the broker? It's not a direct verification, no. Well, it's not a direct or an indirect verification, is it, Mr Rankin? Um, I, I still personally think indirect verification reference to a benchmark is a form of indirect verification, but it's So you don't accept mind. what I've put to you, that that's all about assessment of serviceability rather than checking that the information contained in the form about the customer's expenses is in fact accurate? Um, yeah, the primary purpose of obtaining the expenses is for the serviceability. Yes, thank you. Um, but the National Credit Act prohibited uh, at this time that your statement's directed to in March 2017 and still prohibits ANZ from entering into a loan with a customer without making reasonable inquiries about the customer's financial situation and taking reasonable steps to verify the customer's financial situation. You're aware of that? Yes, I am. And you're aware that the customer's financial situation includes not only the customer's income, but the customer's expenses? Yes. Are you aware, Mr Rankin, of uh, a regulatory guide uh, published by ASIC, which is Regulatory Guide 209, Credit Licensing Responsible Lending Conduct? Yes, I am. Could I ask that that be brought up? It's document RCD 0021-0001-0088. And could I take you first to page 16 of this document, Mr Rankin? Uh, is, that, is that the best? It's really hard to... I, I think we can, we can move in oh, okay. on, on particular right. parts of it. Uh, it's 209.32 that I wanted to ask you questions about. You said you were familiar with this document? Uh, yes. Yes, so you understand that this is the guidance provided by ASIC to assist entities with complying with their responsible lending obligations under the National Credit Act? Yes, it's about their, about their expectations of... Yes. Um, yes. Yes, and do you accept that these are reasonable expectations in this document? Do you disagree with any of them? Um, there's aspects of it that I, I um, personally um, still wonder how it would be possible to operationalise to, to the letter that they've got there. And yeah. what, what are they, Mr Rankin? Uh, it's, uh, it's their concept of scalability, um, specifically where they say every, um, I think the words they use in the document is, um, every situation must be considered on its merits and then your procedures must be appropriate to that. Um, and what, what do you disagree with about that? Oh, I, don't, I don't disagree, it's just yeah. that I find, I'm just putting an operational hat on, I'm, it makes it very complex to design processes that, you know, make sure you adhere to that in every single circumstance. There's so many variations on people's circumstances. Do you accept that you need to adhere to it in every single circumstance involving every single customer? Uh, we need to take reasonable steps to, yes. absolutely, reasonable steps, absolutely. Yes. So uh, I just want to understand the scalability problem. Is it because ANZ has so many customers that it's difficult to have systems in place that permit that? 
it's it's not the number it's the it's the variations in in individual customer circumstances and just the you know the subjective nature of reasonable you know that type of thing right well if any of these parts that i refer you to mr rankin are parts that you um, uh, take issue with you'll tell me as we go uh, yes yes so can we start with two just before we leave that can i just come back to the scalability issue that you think presents operational difficulties. It depends whether you uh, treat scalability as something requiring a degree of variation over a curve, or whether you take the top end of the uh, curve, doesn't it, Mr Rankin? There's no difficulty if you took the top end of the curve, that is the worst case scenario, and said, right, regardless, we're going to apply this in the worst uh, the standards that would apply to the worst possible case, the hardest possible case, we're going to apply those across the board. There'd be no difficulty about that, would there? Uh, you, you could do that. The um, reality of that um, situation would be for simple cases, we would be having very onerous um, processes and procedures. The complexity, the cost and the time of implementing that for every application would be significant. There's a trade-off, isn't there? The, the, yeah, there's a customer yeah. benefit trade-off, yes. Or at least the bank regards there as being a trade-off. Is that right? Uh, um, regards it and, um, yeah, we have experience where that would be the case. Yeah, let me just make plain what lies behind the question, because at least an available point of view may be, I don't say it is, an available point of view may be that the trade-off is between administrative convenience and obeying the law. Now that's a very awkward trade-off if that's the way it's seen, isn't it, Mr Rankin? Uh, look, I think ANZ takes its obligations, legal, regulatory and others, very, very seriously. We're very um, focused on complying with those. Um, we want to do that in a reasonable level and I guess it's down to that subject to nature of the word reasonable. Yes. Uh, just because you've raised this part of the document, uh, Mr Rankin, I'll show you uh, page 12, which deals with scalability of all inquiries and verification obligations uh, to confirm that that is the part of the document that you're referring to. You see there the reference to we consider, as it considers that the obligation to make reasonable inquiries and take reasonable steps to verify information is scalable. That is, what you need to do to meet these obligations in relation to a particular consumer will vary depending on the circumstances. Yes. Yes. Now, is that the part of the document that you were referring to? Yes. Yes. All right. Now, could I take you back to uh, page 16? and 209.32. And you see there that ASIC tells us that reasonable inquiries about a consumer's financial situation will generally include, in B, the extent of the consumer's fixed expenses, such as rent, repayment of existing debts, ch existing debts child support, and recurring expenses, such as insurance. And in 209.33 below, which we'll need to expand, depending on the circumstances of the particular kind of credit contract or consumer lease they may acquire, reasonable inquiries could also include the consumer's other expenditure that may be discretionary, such as entertainment, takeaway food, alcohol, tobacco and gambling. Now, do you agree that these are things that uh, ANZ should be verifying uh, when it is verifying the financial situation of the consumer in accordance with its statutory obligation under the National Credit Act? Uh, our, our processes on those categories are to have a conversation with the customer, understand what their stated expenses are, and then to the extent to which we, to the extent to which we need to consider whether they're at a reference to the benchmark. But you don't have a conversation with the customer when the information comes from a broker, do you? Uh, the broker has that, has that conversation mm -hmm. with the customer at their initial interview. 
And as we've established, you don't need to verify what the broker tells you about the customer's expenses, expenses. You don't do anything to check that that information accurately represents the customer's expenses. Their general living expenses, no. Okay. Why is it in the broker's interest, broker's interest to pin the customer down? Why is it in the broker's interest to interrogate the customer when the customer reports living expenses as, as X dollars a month? What's in it for the broker to say, oh, are you sure? Is that right? Uh, it, up to the individual broker, I suppose. They're acting as agent for the customer. Well, are they? There's a nice question uh, about who's agents who, uh, who's the agent for who in this transaction, but we can have a debate about that later. But do you agree with me there is no incentive for the broker to interrogate the customer about expenses? Um, that they have their own obligations under their own um, licensing requirements to um, ensure the product's not suitable for the customer and understand their customer's position. And, and th there's no incentive because they know the bank will default to hire of declared expenses or HAM. Is that right? Uh, yes. And they know that the bank will do that or at least it would be open to a broker to conclude that the bank defaulting to him was seen by the bank as the bank meeting its obligations about responsible lending. Isn't that right? Uh, you still require the initial conversation with the customer about their, their living expenses and then referencing it to the HEM. Yeah. It's both steps. You know, having interrupted you, let me take you back to just this question of UMI, the uncommitted monthly income, isn't it? Is it yes. that the proper understanding of the, yes. <laughs> the acronym? Uh, we all end up talking in acronyms. Um, You said in calculating UMI, the bank would uh, sometimes apply buffers to true. some of the numbers that go into that calculation. Yes, it's true. Now, uh, if I am treading on matters of commercial confidence, you need to speak up. Do you understand me? If I am about to tread into matters where you need to be a little circumspect. Uh, you should speak up, then we'll decide whether you can be circumspect. But uh, interest rates are historically low. Do you agree? I do. Uh, if you take account of repayments at today's level, uh, you are taking account of repayments uh, geared to historically low interest rates, is that right? Yes. Does the bank uh, ordinarily apply a buffer to uh, repayment levels? Does it uh, apply a buffer that uh, would have regard to uh, what would be uh, the uh, historical uh, general level of interest rates? Uh, it's a reference to uh, the yeah, long-term average through the cycle, is, is the phrase there. It's of the order of about 7 plus percent, I think. 7.25, correct. 7.25, is it? Yes. Uh, so, so the buffer, though, is we, the, there's two parts to the buffer. That's the floor. There's also uh, an actual buffer to the um, uh, effective rate the customer's paying. So if the customer's paying 4%, we have a buffer of 2.25% to that which it actually gets you only to 6.25, hence we apply a floor of 7.25. If interest rates higher, 6%, we would apply a buffer of 2.25 to 6, which would be at 8.25. So we'd yes. assess it at the 8.25. Yes. Go on, Ms. Orr. Uh, could I ask that you look at page 20 of this document, Mr. Rankin, and clause 209.46 on that page? 
You see there that ASIC tells ANZ and others that you are obliged to take reasonable steps to verify a consumer's financial situation. Generally, this will require some positive steps to verify the information provided by the consumer. Uh, do you agree with that? Yes. And, and do you agree that ANZ does not take positive steps to verify the customer's expenses? Uh, no, not all expenses. I'm sorry, you, you agree, but you confine your answer to only some of the customer's expenses, is that right? So the general living expenses, which is one component of customer's expenses, um, as we've repeated many times today, we take their stated level that they you know, attest to, and then we reference that to the benchmark. Mm -hmm. And you'd agree that where a customer provides information about their expenses that is inconsistent with other information that ANZ holds about the customer, uh, such as information contained in bank statements, uh, it's important to make further inquiries in the verification of the information? Uh, no, I, I don't agree with that statement. So when the customer's expenses are inconsistent with bank, sta with bank statements that ANZ holds, you yes. don't think that it's necessary to take further steps to deal with that inconsistency? Um, no, not necessarily. Well, what Does ANZ ignore that inconsistency? Uh, the fact there's an inconsistency of itself doesn't mean that the customer's stated um, living expenses are incorrect. Well, what, what does it mean? It, it should cause you to question what the customer has told the broker or what the broker has recorded for the customer, should it not? Uh, well, it's about what's the most appropriate step to take to get ourselves comfortable the customer's stated living expenses are appropriate. Yes, so what I'm putting to you is that you've got bank accounts that show that the expenses are different to what is recorded in the document submitted by the broker. You say you do nothing about that? Uh, there are, we, our processes are we do nothing. There are transactions on those statements that are inconsistent with the statement of position and we don't do anything. Well, do, do you think that's satisfactory, Mr Rankin? Um, I personally do, yes. And, and why is that? Why do you think that holding two pieces of in, inconsistent information about the customer's expenses, ANZ can choose to ignore that yeah. Uh, and the consequences of that for the assessment of whether that loan is not unsuitable for the customer. Yeah, we're talking about the um, manual review of paper-based bank statements um, and to use those to verify customers' statement of position, particularly general living expenses, um, would be highly complex, um, very time-consuming, very costly and ultimately um, not necessarily that helpful. So, as I understand your answer, it's too hard to do that. It's too hard to do anything about an inconsistency, so it's ignored. Uh, it's not that it's too hard, it's actually that um, it, it is hard, but it's not that it's too hard, it's, it's too hard, but there's other ways to get to a better level. What are those ways? How do you deal with that situation where you've got bank statements showing different expenditure by the customer, higher expenditure by the customer, than is recorded in the documents submitted by the broker? What are the other ways of dealing with that? Uh, that's the purpose of the customer interview guide. We have the, the, the sorry, the, in the initial customer interview. You have the discussion with the customer. What are their stated living, their general living expenses? Um, discuss that with them in a variety of categories to get a um, thorough discussion, and then reference the total of that amount to a, a independently verified, statistically re relevant benchmark. Mm, so I, I just want to be very clear. Make sure I understand this. And you're saying that as a result of that interview information is put in a document provided by the broker and if that information is contradictory or inconsistent with other information that ANZ holds, you would other information that ANZ holds and proceed with what you've been told by the broker and whatever consequences arise for your serviceability assessment uh, of the loan for the customer I, I, ANZ's not concerned about that? Sorry, I just, there was um, something... I'm sorry, could, I put, that was that? far too long a question. Yes, sorry. Uh, I, I just want to make sure I understand that your evidence is when you have a statement of financial position submitted by a broker that contains uh, information about a customer's expenses and you have your own information 
about the customer's expenses, such as bank statements, which is inconsistent with that. You ignore your own information, despite the fact that that may mean that the customer's expenses have been incorrectly stated, and therefore the assessment of whether that product is suitable for the customer may well go awry. There's two adjustments I'd probably make to your statement. The, Thank you. the first is um, we're using the customer's stated expenses on yes. their statement of position, which is signed by the customer, yes. as being true and correct. Um, and secondly, there's another part to your... Uh, I've lost that train of thought. Was well, another I, I was asking you about the consequences of this for the oh, assessment of suitability of yes. the product. So there's another one when you talked about um, actually having uh, bank statements or, or within our possession. If they were ANZ... Um, accounts yes and we have those in a digital form yes um, at the moment we're trialing the use of exactly that looking at um, how do we categorize expenses general living expenses to be able to pre-populate a statement of position for the customer to allow us to have a more rich conversation you would still need so we wouldn't be ignoring them in that case but at the same point you'd still be that would be the basis of your conversation rather than a blank sheet of paper if the customer said actually no these aren't the items, this is my general living expenses, and put that to the statement of position, signed it, submitted it to us, we wouldn't do anything further. In over half of the cases, it's not your conversation, is it? It's the broker's conversation. Uh, correct. Yeah, and the broker, I thought we'd agreed, correct me if I'm wrong, there is nothing in it for the broker to interrogate what the witness, uh, what the witness tells you, what the uh, uh, customer is telling the, the broker. Uh, other than their own licensing obligations. I want to put to you, Mr Rankin, that your processes or your lack of processes in relation to the verification of a customer's expenses are non-compliant with the National Credit Act responsible lending obligations and with this uh, regulatory guide issued by ASIC. I, I, I disagree. I, th I think um, I in, a, in a practical example, if you have um, a bank statement has a series of transactions on it, you have to identify which of those transactions, to the extent of what's more appropriate, manual review of um, bank statements versus taking a customer's stated level expenses and comparing that to an independently provided statistical benchmark. If we're interrogating... Um, the customer's bank statements were identifying individual transactions. We'd probably need to go back 12 months as some expenses are paid annually, not monthly. Um, we then need to ask customers, you know, what the nature of that transaction was individually, if it was above or below their, what we deemed their reasonable level. It would be a very highly complex, um, complex situation. You'd end up then documenting various transactions individually as from the customer as to why they were or were not, were not ongoing. If they're one-off, etc., discretionary nature, so discretionary nature, items that they propose not to continue with, you'd have all that documentation. They then sign that rationale, and you'd, you're back to where we are any, at the moment, which is relying on a signed statement from the customer. In any case, well, given how much you rely on that signed statement, Mr. Rankin, why do you bother asking the broker to submit the documentation? Because I think what we've just heard is it's put to one side; it's not analysed by ANZ certainly not analysed from an expenses perspective, why do you bother asking the broker to provide it? Uh, we asked to provide the documentation for verification of income. Of income. And um, to the extent there's uh, other financial liabilities that we're refinancing as part of the loan. Yes, I see. Um, I want to come back to the HEM now, Mr yep. Rankin, because in your explanation of the... Uh, uh, steps involved in the automation process, one of them in 54H of your statement, which you've already referred to, is confirmation that the higher of the customer's stated living expenses or the income adjusted HEM benchmark had been included in the application. And would you agree, you may have heard evidence about this already, would you agree that the HEM is a conservative measure of expenditure rather than a typical or average figure, which means that many consumers will have higher expenses than HEM? Uh, and, and some consumers would have lower as well. But, but do you agree with my proposition to you, Mr Rankin, that it's not typical or average, it's conservative, and therefore many consumers would have higher expenses than HEM? Um, in terms of, it depends on the category of expenses within HEM. 
So um, there's three categories. So the HEM is based on an underlying housing survey done by the ABS. Um, the, the individual expenses in that are then categorised into three broad buckets. Um, absolute basic, discretionary basic, yes. and then discretionary. Yes. Um, the absolute basic expenses, um, the HEM that's currently used is based on the 50th percentile or the median average of that category. Yes. So it's not the average per se, it's the median. Um, so 50% of um, observations are above that number and 50% are below that number. With the discretionary basics, they take the 25th percentile. Mm. So one in three Australians spend more than that on those discretionary basic ca categories um, and one in four Australians would spend less than that. Um, do you accept ASIC's characterisation of him as a conservative measure? Uh, it, um, I, I, I can only really state the statistical basis it's on. Everyone's going to have their opinion as to whether that's, you know, conservative or otherwise. Well, what, what's ANZ's opinion on it, Mr Rankin? Does ANZ accept that it's a conservative measure of expenditure? Uh, ANZ um, has a view that you could improve the level that benchmark that the HEM benchmark's been set at, yes. Improve in, in that it should be higher? Uh, yes, different components of it, yes. Yes. ANZ's reliance on the HEM has been significant, hasn't it? Yes. Um, uh, both before and after uh, ASIC put out its review of broker remuneration report, which included quite a bit of discussion on HEM. That's correct. Uh, could I ask that you be shown a document which is not annexed to your statement? It's ANZ 800 321 Now, uh, in April 2017, KPMG undertook a review of ANZ's home lending processes. Yes. And they did that at the request of APRA. That's correct. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a, a document that produces the results of that review. That's correct. And you're familiar with this document, Mr Rankin? Yes, I am. Uh, and could I ask that you uh, look first at 0093? <clears throat> and we see there from the covering letter that the targeted review was a review of ANZ's policies, procedures and controls to ensure that borrower financial information received and captured as part of the home loan underwriting process was complete and accurate in ANZ systems. <coughs> yes. Now, could you turn to uh, 0095? And do you see there under 1.1 exceptions and findings that KPMG undertook a detailed review of a sample of 418 loan files? And for those 418 files, KPMG made 138 separate observations. And 68 of those related to incomplete or incorrect borrower financial information used in the bank's assessment of the home loan, with 24 of the 68 due to incomplete borrower income being recorded as a result of the bank's practice of only verifying income to the extent necessary to demonstrate that uncommitted monthly income is positive. In 10 of the 68 cases, there would have been negative UMI had the correct financial information been used. Uh, now, could I ask you to move to uh, 0096? And do you see there under the table that KPMG expressed concerns about the highly manual nature of the systems and loan assessment process at ANZ, which made it prone to error? Yes. And KPMG made a number of comments and recommendations in relation to a variety of matters, but they included ANZ's processes for the verification of income, liabilities and expenses. Is that right? Yes. And could I ask you to look at 0100? Mm. 
Do you see there, under the heading expenses in the table, ANZ policy, loan applicants are required to state their monthly expenses on the statement of financial position. Monthly expenses are broken down as follows. Credit commitments, rent board, insurances, child maintenance, general living expenses and other. Credit commitments are verified for ANZ liabilities but are subject to the same limitations for non-ANZ liabilities as outlined above. Other expenses such as rent or board and insurance are not verified to external evidence. Other general living expenses are not further broken down. They are not verified as such, but are compared with an income-linked household expenditure measure and ANZ adopts the higher of the two amounts. Uh, and uh, that, that's all I need to take you to there. I see that there is a redaction. Um, and then... If I could take you to point 132 and 131, if they could be displayed on the screen at the same time. We see what you've already told us. KPMG found that the officer or assessor would use the amount stated by the customer on the statement of position. I'll just wait till that comes up so you can see that, but I think that's been your evidence already. Yes in which case we can move straight to 103, where we see the percentage of files that KPMG reported um, involved the use of the HEM. So at 103, See there under verification of expenses, description of finding, there is an inherent difficulty in verifying the completeness of a customer's living expenses. The bank's policy is to adopt the higher of customer stated living expenses or the HEM benchmark. We noted a heavy reliance on the HEM benchmark with 73% of files tested defaulting to the benchmark. Now, do you think that remains the sort of percentage that you see today in ANZ files resorting to the HEM benchmark? Yes, it is. Yes. And KPMG made a number of recommendations about your policies in relation to the verification of expenses. You'll see those at 101. Do you see under ANZ specific first dot point, ANZ could ask customers to provide a more detailed breakdown of expenses. This would provide ANZ with greater insight and assist customers in ensuring stated expenses are complete and accurate. ANZ could ask customers to provide documentary evidence of their major expenses. Uh, and then third dot point, in order to address the risk that customers fail to disclose major items of expenditure, ANZ could ask customers to supply bank statements for their main transaction accounts, as well as credit card statements. Final dot point, bank statements could also be reviewed for general account conduct to identify whether there are any obvious inconsistencies between a customer's stated expenses and transaction history, or any general indicators of financial stress. Now, so these are the recommendations made by KPMG. In light of the evidence you've given today, I assume that ANZ will not be taking up any of these recommendations. Uh, no, it's only the final one, that fourth dot point. Uh, dot point. The other three are in place or being trialled at the moment. And, and why is that, given that you say it's too hard to look at these documents once you have them and you should be entitled to just rely on the statement of financial position? Uh, because it's that fourth one is the only one that really pertains to general living expenses. Mm -hmm. If you look at the first one, mm -hmm. uh, do I can do you want me to go through the, yes, we're, the what we're doing? Yes. Um, so if we look at the first one, um, breaking down detailed expenses, that's um, in place now across all our channels, and we've taken general living expenses and broken that down into fifteen separate categories. Um, the results to date have been um, uh, about, uh, I suppose balance, so positive and negative. On the one hand, customers and bankers really um, appreciate 
the ability that having the further detail of expense breakdown means they have a richer conversation with um, the customers and customers report having a better understanding of what their expenses are. Uh, the actual outcomes are though that the amount that still def have to default to him as a result of even breaking that down further is it hasn't changed a bit. What it has done is actually increased the number of customers who have um, stated expenses outside of the general living <coughs> expense bucket. So things like um, insurances that wouldn't have sat within the general living expense bucket. So people generally, it's sort of just reflective of the fact that customers generally um, seem to understate their expenses. Is there anything else you'd like to say about this? Uh, in the second dot point, um, documentary evidence of major expenses, um, we're, we're trialling that at the moment, um, just within, uh, I think, our proprietary channels, looking at three months of bank statements. The, the trick there is can you identify from the transaction history, you know, the way that transaction's actually recorded, if, whether it's actually enough to allow you to say, oh, that's your rent or, oh, that's a, a child maintenance expense or what it is. So it's just, but again, those are for the bits that are outside the general living expenses category. Mm. And um, that's not for the uh, broker channel? Uh, we haven't, so we, we tend to trial um, new things within our proprietary channel first until we bed down the process and get rid of all the bugs before we roll it out to the broker channel. Um, main transaction credit card statements, could high level review, underscore, yeah, the, the credit commitment. So that's that third one's around, can we see payments to other financial institutions as a way of identifying if there's a previously undisclosed existing home loan or personal loan, et cetera. So those three are uh, um, either in place or under what it being trialled. Being trialled in the proprietary, in the proprietary division. Yes, and if, if they're successful, we would um, we would likely roll that out if we can, you know, make sure that the process works appropriately and is, is you know achieving all the things it needs to. And the fourth dot point is not being taken up. The idea that you could review bank statements for general account conduct to identify any obvious inconsistencies. Uh, and, and that's the one where, um, as I previously stated, that the complexity, the time, the cost for the um, benefit, it, the, the, we don't think that that's a material uplift to having the detail, you know, in combination with the first one, having the detailed conversation with the customer, them attesting to that and signing that's the correct statement of position and us referencing that to an independent statistical benchmark. So is the answer yes, it's not being taken up at the moment? Uh, it's not being taken up. There Thank is there, there's one exception to that, I suppose, is mm -hmm. is that um, and in this report we talked to some strategic um, solutions we're looking at, where um, ultimately a lot of this hangs on the quality of that conversation you're having with the customer about their state of living expenses. Mm -hmm. um, we are investing heavily towards it requires an industry initiative where you could actually. Um, transfer digitally those transaction amounts between banks such that we could and we could then look at those individual transactions categorize them into different buckets of expenses bring that together in a summarized position and present that as a pre-populated statement of position to a customer based on their you know whether it's three months six months or probably likely 12 months and that would then form the basis of a good conversation with the customer here's your last 12 months of expenses neatly summarized and categorized across a range of bank statements or bank accounts you have, including credit cards, you'd still need to have that conversation. How many of those aren't uh, one-off and non-recurring? They'd still have to refer to, ultimately we'd still be relying on a customer's stated number and then we'd still prudently have to refer that to an independent benchmark. And just staying with those uh, first three dot points, as you say, you've rolled them out or beginning to roll them out in the proprietary channel. How would they work in the broker channel? Would you have the broker do that or would the bank do that? Um, the, the first one is rolled out in, in all channels. Um, so it's the breakdown of living expenses. Um, so the brokers do that um, already. Mm -hmm. yes. So you depend so, on the broker there. What about the second and third? Uh, how would we roll it out in the broker, broker channel? channel? Yeah, I, I'd be... Um, hypothesising about a process that we haven't yet bedded down in the proprietary, we're only in trial. I'd because unless the bank checks those things, uh, what's the value of rolling it out uh, and asking brokers to do it? Um, Ultimately, it, it's the bank that's going to have to do the checking, isn't it? Sure. If, you, if we can make it easier for the brokers to even have that conversation, say, by, a, you know, 
the pre-populated statement, <coughs> statement and financial position, that would be great. The, the word conversation is uh, commonly used in this uh, field of discourse. I understand that. Uh, but can I come back to that basic question? What's in it for the broker to make sure that the client is telling the truth or facing the truth, not that the client's misleading, but that the client is facing the truth of his, her uh, expenditure. There's nothing in it for the broker, is there? Um, if, if, the, if the broker at the moment um, is writing a lot of loans that go into default within a short period of time, um, that would warrant, that would come up on our dashboards and would warrant a detailed file review of their files. And if, um, it was seen that they weren't um, exercising their obligations appropriately. We looked to, um, you know, consequence manage of that, which could be discreditation with ANZ. Commissioner, I tender this document. Uh, that will be Exhibit 1.87, uh, ANZ 800 321 0092, KPMG targeted review 2016 2017. Could I ask you also to look at ANZ 800 Mr Rankin? Have I got that? It will come oh. up now. <laughs> this is a letter dated 18 September 2017 from ANZ uh, to APRA dealing with the findings of the KPMG review. Are you familiar with that document? Yes, I am. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.88, ANZ 800 321 0124, letter ANZ to uh, Horton APRA. I want to return to deal with one final limb of the automated, I'm sorry, the manual component of the process that you've described in your statement, Mr Rankin, and that's referred to in 54J of your statement. One of the steps is the recalculation of the customer's UMI, the uncommitted monthly income, based on the financial information determined through the steps above. Yes. Yes, so having done all of those steps, the uncommitted monthly income is revisited, is that right? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, and could I ask you to go back to your third exhibit, ANZ 800 282 0001. This is the mortgage credit requirements. Uh, and I'll ask that you be shown 0048 in that document. So we see there that this part of the mortgage credit requirements deals with assessing the ability to repay. Uh, credit facilities are only to be offered to borrowers who can demonstrate an ability to repay over the life of the loan. And the way that's done is by looking at this uncommitted monthly income. If the UMI is positive, then the customer is considered to have the capacity to repay. And the UMI, as we've discussed, is determined by deducting from net income, personal living expenses, credit commitments, and any other regular fixed commitments the borrower may have. This is ANZ's policy about assessing the ability to repay? Yes. And are you familiar, Mr Rankin, with section 131 of the National Credit Act and the obligation it contains to assess a credit contract as unsuitable for a customer if a customer could only comply with their financial obligations under the contract with substantial hardship. Yes. And are you aware of the statutory presumption in section 131 subsection 3 that a credit contract will be unsuitable for a customer if the customer could only comply with their obligations under the credit contract by selling their principal place of residence? Yes. And ANZ's assumption that a customer has the capacity to repay based only on whether the UMI is positive, I want to put to you is rather too broad brush an approach to deal with the responsible lending obligations that I've just directed you to. 
In, in what way? Well, how does this take into account substantial hardship to the customer? There is a positive figure at the end of the day. We don't know what that positive figure is. It might be small, but there is a positive amount and therefore ANZ assesses that there is an ability to repay. Where in that does ANZ as assess whether that leaves the uh, customer nonetheless in a position of substantial <laughs> hardship to meet their obligations under the contract? Yes, so it looks at um, that calculation of UMI, it looks at firstly the items of income, mm -hmm. to the extent that any of those items of income are seasonal or um, potentially have a level of volatility in them, there's buffers applied to those levels of income, so we reduce those amounts, so we're sensitising the income level. Mm -hmm. um, then we look at the major expense items and then general living expenses. We take the higher of what the customer says, so if a customer says, these are my living expenses, those are my income, that's my income level. We've sensitised down the income. We've then sensitised the um, existing, um, any existing credit limit, uh, you know, obligations they have for other credit contracts, such as if they've got existing home loans or personal loans or credit cards, we then put it a buffers above what they're currently paying on those to ensure that those obligations, plus we sensitise the repayments for the credit contract being assessed for at the higher of the you know, the floor of 7.25 or a buffer of 2.25 on the customer's effective rate, um, and then we take their general expenses and compare that to the benchmark. So it's a sensitised calculation. Those sensitivities factored into it, um, you don't accept that it's too blunt an approach to just ensure that there is some figure left, some positive figure, some positive figure left as the UMI at the end of this? Uh, no, because the, the reality is within that calculation, there'd be um, large, well, you know, there'd, there'd be more than positive um, actual balances there. All right, Mr Rankin, um, I want to ask you about the evidence of Mr Robert Regan. Uh, you heard, I hope, the evidence of Mr Regan on yes, Friday did. afternoon, uh, and you've read the witness statement of Mr Regan. Yes, I have. Uh, and the bundle of documents that Mr Regan provided uh, to his broker and which were divided on to ANZ are annexed to your witness statement, is that right? Uh, yes, they are, although um, if I recall in his witness statement he talks about utility bills that were provided, but we've not seen those. I see. I so perhaps with the exception of the utility bills. Uh, there was two points there, utility bills and something else but that I remember. So what's contained in your exhibit WAR7 are the documents that ANZ got from the broker, from Mr Regan's broker, is that right? Uh, that's correct. And one of those documents was a letter from Centrelink dated the 4th of February 2016. Uh, yes. Now, I think you've also... Uh, I'm sorry, I'll just find the reference so that can be for you. 3076, thank you, Mr Rankin. Now, you, uh, gave, you uh, gave evidence earlier this morning that ANZ's policies in relation to government benefits, uh, such as an age pension, which is what we see here in Mr Rankin's document. Regan, sorry. I'm sorry, Mr That's Regan's good. document, I'm sorry. I do it myself. Um, you told us this morning that your internal policies for the verification of that income required a letter from Centrelink within 60 days of the signed statement of position confirming ongoing payments or a transactional history in a bank account? That's correct. Uh, but this Centrelink letter provided by the broker used by Mr Regan uh, doesn't meet your requirements, does it? Because it's dated the 4th of February 2016. Correct. So ANZ did not receive documentation that allowed it to comply with its own policies for the verification of Mr Regan's income? Uh, no, that's not correct. That's why the bank statements are omitted. Well, the bank statements, according to your policies, needed to be for a three-month consecutive period, um, showing consistent receipt of the income over that period. Do you say that you had three months' worth of bank statements for Mr Regan? No. No. So you did not have documentation from Mr Regan's broker that enabled ANZ to comply with its own policies for the verification of income? Uh, no. It's, no. It's an example of a uh, what we call an override, which is where our, um, 
assessors have a credit authority discretion um, where they can still comply with the spirit of the policy, then they'll, they'll do that. Well, what, are you confident that there was an override rather than just a failure to comply with your policy? Uh, yes, confidence just an override. I'm and sorry, could you repeat yeah, that? Yes, so I'm, 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 I'm confident that is, that's an example of uh, an override. And what, what's the basis for the override here? Uh, we have the um, uh, statement from Centrelink. Um, it's for the life of it's a pension. The, the nature of the income is that it's for life. Um, we have no reason to believe that the Centrelink pension would be cancelled for this customer. What we're trying to verify is what's the actual amount um, and it's, as you can see here, it's, it's, when you compare it to the bank statements, it's actually a slightly higher amount in the bank statements. We've seen one bank statement, there's two payments of that, fortnightly payments. The assessor would have said, that's fine, that's all I need. I don't need to get another couple of months, it won't show me anything new. And have you uh, annexed any documents to your statement that override and the basis for that override? Uh, no, we haven't. No. Are there any documents that record that there was an override and the basis for the override? Uh, no, recording of overrides for verification has only been in place uh, since the end of September last year. Right. So they weren't in place at the So, stage. So does that mean you're assuming, Mr Rankin, that there was an override because you have no documents from which you can satisfy yourself that that in fact occurred? Yeah, th th those were the words I used, I was assuming. Yes. Um, you don't know whether instead this was just someone not complying with your policies? Uh, not complying with the strict letter of the policies, yes. Well, well, you, you said before in answer to my questions that the mortgage credit requirements are to be adhered to by ANZ employees. Yes. Uh, you, you don't resolve from that? Uh, no, they do. But obviously, I think I also mentioned that our assessors have um, credit authority discretions. So the policies are written in very strict basis and the assessors have... Um, depending on their level of training, the level of experience, they have a level of um, authority to uh, apply discretion to those policies um, to get the, to ensure the spirit of the policy is still met, um, but the specifics could be, you know, such that there's no, no, no the, the benefit of adhering to it versus the negative customer impact of requiring to go through the steps, um, it's not aligned. You're unable to say whether there was any discretion exercised or whether this might have just been an ANZ employee failing to adhere to your policies? Uh, the um, assessor, who is a credit authority holder, makes the assessment based on, I've, I've seen this document, like they, they've, it's in the file what they've looked at. So either if in a hindsight review, a credit review, if they didn't have the authority to make that um, uh, discretion, it would be picked up and be part of the performance but we, management. We only find that out if there is a hindsight file review down the down the track. Otherwise, we don't know, do we? No, but our, our assessors are very paranoid about hindsight reviews. Yes, they take them very seriously. I see. It's also the case for Mr. Regan, is it not, Mr. Rankin, that the statement of financial position that was provided to ANZ by the broker misstated Mr Regan's income. Do you agree? Uh, his income? His income. Is it material, it's a materially misstated or is it it's just a, it's a dollar, isn't it? Are you aware that there was a loan review conducted on uh, Mr Regan's file on the 15th of February this year? Uh, yes, I saw that document. Yes, can I ask that that be brought up? That's ANZ 800 141 3268. So in the month prior to these hearings commencing, ANZ conducted a, a review on Mr Regan's file? Yes. Yes. Uh, and could I ask that you look at uh, 3269 in that document. And we see there under analysis, uh, third paragraph, combined income, combined income confirmed equals 2,383 net per month. Signed SP, statement of position. Signed statement of position declared income 2,663, the lower utilised for servicing. So that 
disjunct didn't raise any flags in ANZ systems? Uh, I'm not aware. I, I, I don't understand where the 2383 comes from. I've been trying myself to try and understand how you get from the documents that, um, that both the uh, superannuation statement and the Centrelink statement and the items coming through in the bank statement through his income, mm -hmm. how they align to the 2383. I, I but that was the income confirmed by ANZ, 2383. Uh, on, on review? Yes. Yeah, on actually in the assessment system, at the time of assessment, it was 2662. Yes. But do you say that, it w I'm trying to understand, sorry, when do you say this disjunct was identified? When do you say the $2,383 per month was used yeah, in I, ANZ's processes? Uh, all I'm saying is I, I also don't understand when that's used in the processes. I don't I understand see. that figure, how it was derived. I see. I'd like to. Yeah, hope the ANZ employee who completed the loan review understood, Mr Rankin. Me too. Yes. Have you discussed it with her? Her name is on the document, no, Miss Margaret Delahunty. No, I haven't. No, you haven't. I'll tender this document, Commissioner. Uh, <laughs> it will be Exhibit uh, 1.89, document ANZ 800-141-3268, loan review, Regan, 15 February 18. Now, could I ask you some questions about the documents that were provided to ANZ um, by Mr Regan's broker, which are Exhibit 7 to your statement? They include the Statement of um, Financial Position, which is uh, 800141, uh, ANZ 800-141-3020. Now, do we see there, Mr Rankin, that Mr Regan's total living expenses are listed as $1,140 on an average monthly basis? Uh, yes, that's correct. And that was about $50 less than the HEM benchmark, benchmark figure of $1,189? That's correct. So ANZ's uh, UMI calculate, calculator defaulted to the higher HEM benchmark figure of $1,189. Correct. And you've heard evidence from Mr Regan and you've read his witness statement that the figure that came to be listed in this statement of financial position, $1,140, underestimated his monthly living expenses by approximately $1,800. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, you've made clear in your statement that the bank statements that were provided to the bank for Mr Regan were used only for the purposes of verifying the, in the, verifying the income amount, uh, not for expenses. That's correct. Um, now, can I take you to those bank statements, which are at... Uh, ANZ 800 141 3066. <coughs> uh, now, I, I think uh, it's clear, Mr Rankin, that the ANZ employee who um, did the assessment of the suitability of this loan for Mr Regan would not have looked at the summary of the amounts of money going in and out of his uh, six accounts at Credit Union Australia for the purposes of assessing or verifying his expenses. Is that right? That's correct. So the ANZ employee would have paid no regard uh, to the fact that Mr Regan's everyday 55 plus account was approximately $4,000 up at the end of this month, but the Platinum Plus account was about $5,000 down and the eSaver Reward account was about $15,000 down. That's correct. And it doesn't take more than a few seconds to see that, does it, Mr Rankin? Um, no. And based on this, um, if someone had looked at it, it would have been obvious that Mr Regan's expenses in this month were much more 
than reflected in the statement of financial position. Yes. Um, but despite ANZ's obligations under the National Credit Act to make reasonable inquiries into Mr Regan's financial position uh, and the short period of time it would have taken to see that there was something wrong with the expenses listed on the document, um, ANZ ignored this bank statement for anything other than verification of income. That's correct. Yes. Um, the, the inconsistency with this bank statement to the signed statement of position. Yes. Um, that's equally there in the um, revised signed statement of position that Mr. Regan submitted subsequently. In the revised statement of financial position. Uh, yes, that Mr. Regan submitted as part of his his documents. Yes. Uh, now, have you annexed that to your statement, Mr. Rankin? No, I haven't. Right. Are you talking about as part of a hardship? application? Uh, yes. Yes, oh, I see. I see. Um, now, uh, can I um, ask you to look at uh, a document that I'd like you to um, consider so that I can ask you some questions about the manual assessment of Mr Regan's loan? Um, we've heard your evidence about the steps involved in that manual assessment. Uh, and. ANZ keeps a log of uh, its employees' interactions with customers and third parties in that manual assessment process. Is that right? Uh, there's, um, I think it's in the DNA tool that's then recorded in the MOZ system, there's a, uh, well, a log of the assessor's comments. Is that what you're referring yes, to? Yes, it is. Yep. Could I show you a document which is ANZ 800 <laughs> Is this the log of the assessor's comments, Mr Rankin? Um, that's my understanding, yes. And can I take you to 3103 in this, doc in this document? Now, do we see there, Mr Rankin, uh, towards the bottom of the page, some assessment notes relating to income, relating to the assessment of the government benefit. And do you see in the third start point, government benefit assessed at $509 fortnightly. This is a superannuation scheme verified through CSS document provided by Australian government. Considering only the untaxed component for a conservative approach as applicant is aged. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, and that's the only point in these notes that we see any reference to Mr Regan's age being taken into account in the assessment process? Uh, it's the only specific reference, yes. Yes, de despite the fact that Mr Regan was 71 at the time the loan was offered to him and despite the fact that the loan term was 30 years. That's correct. And over the, the page on 3104, we see a reference, perhaps if we could have 3103 and 3104 together so that you can see that this is part of the same set of assessment notes. Do you see at the top of that page, exit strategy, lower LVR, that's loan to value ratio, and unencumbered property with all services connected. Applicant can downsize if required and pay out the loans as he don't haven'ts. Do you see that, Mr Rankin? Yes. So the assessor has identified an exit strategy, being that Mr Regan can sell his house if needed to make the repayments. Uh, uh, Mr Regan or his estate? Yes, I see. If Mr Regan's passed away by that time, his estate could sell his house. Downsizing talks about a transaction in life, I would have thought, doesn't it? Correct. Yeah, the only thing spoken of there is not what the estate can do, but what Mr Regan could do, isn't it? Yes, correct. Sorry. Yeah. Draw my... The reference to estate was a red herring, wasn't it? Uh, in this circumstance, yes. Yes. 
Mr Rankin, uh, you've given evidence earlier of your understanding of the statutory <coughs> presumption in the Nat National Credit Act that an individual can only comply with their obligations under a contract with substantial hardship if they get their loan repayments by selling their home. Yes. So you, you're aware of that? Uh, yes, I am. But this appears to be exactly what said staff member is contemplating when assessing whether or not Mr Regan could make his loan rep Mr Regan could make his loan repayments. Yes, it is. I, I understand there's um, there might be reference to that type of an appropriate exit strategy in ASIC's guidance RG two oh nine. Do you think it's appropriate for the assessor to have been uh, assessing Mr Regan's application for his lo loan on the basis that, if necessary, sell his house and downsize? Um, if that had been an exit strategy that Mr Regan had um, stated he was comfortable with, then yes. Well, it's not Mr Regan's exit strategy, is it, Mr Rankin? No, Mr Regan did not discuss wanting to downsize at all with the bank. This is the bank saying that if he gets into trouble, he can sell his house and move into a smaller house and therefore will approve the loan. Mm. The, the, the gap in terms of the information we have in that interview guide, that, or the interview that the customer has with the broker versus the information our assessors have, not actually having the details of that discussion, is something that we're right on the verge of fixing um, so that um, not only is it clear that the customer has to state what an appropriate, well, what the customer's exit strategy is, the assessor would have that when they're looking at the loan. So if Mr Regan was to, actually it'll be in force in April, so if, you know, end of April, if Mr Regan was to apply for that loan, the assessor would be assessing that with the information about what uh, Mr Regan's desired exit strategy is. Are you on the verge of fixing this, Mr Rankin, having ANZ officers assess loans as suitable for a customer <laughs> in circumstances where they could only comply with substantial hardship by selling their home? Uh, this isn't talking about complying with substantial hardship. I know. No, I'm sorry, I'm trying to draw your attention to the reference in the legislative framework, the presumption being that if you need to sell your home, then you are only complying um, with your repayments with substantial hardship, and therefore the loan is not suitable for you. Uh, so there's two components, as I understand. One yes. is the substantial hardship component, which yes. is can they meet their repayments? Yes. That part is... is um, dealt with in terms of the serviceability assessment and the positive UMI. Here the exit strategy is around the loan term. Um, we, um, we think of exit strategies under two scenarios. Largely it's where the source of the income may not last for the term of the loan, such as approaching retirement, in which case we need to consider what's an appropriate exit strategy for someone. So mm -hmm. take a 30-year loan term, still have 20 years to go uh, before you retire. I don't think customers would expect that we decline a loan on that basis if they have an exit strategy that they could downsize and sell that loan. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the case in Mr Regan's circumstances, given his income is guaranteed for life. So it would have been much more focused towards the, um, the fact that the loan term might have exceeded his life expectancy. Well, what I'm hearing, Mr Rankin, is that you stand by this decision. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, yes, I do. No one at the bank talked to Mr Regan about whether it would be acceptable to him to have to sell his home to make the loan repayments, did they, Mr Rankin? No, they didn't. And Thank that's you. the process deficiency that we're fixing. Thank you. Um, I tender that log, Commissioner. That uh, will be Exhibit 1.90 ANZ 800 log of assessors, comments, re Regan. You tell us in your statement, Mr Rankin, that Mr Regan's loan was approved on the 15th of 2017. That's paragraph 59D of your statement. <coughs> uh, formally approved on the 15th, yes. And it was the 10th of May 2017 when Mr Regan first made contact with ANZ requesting hardship assistance, requesting that action be taken in respect of the loan. That's correct. Uh, and on the 11th of May, uh, ANZ gave Mr Regan a form, a hardship application form to fill out. That's correct. 
and on the 7th of June that form was completed over the phone, completed over the phone uh, with Mr Regan, is that right? Uh, yes. And you recognise in your statement that that application was completed by your staff member incorrectly? It's correct. It's, it's correct. It was incorrect. Uh, and you state that if it was completed correctly, it would have shown then and there that Mr Regan's revised statement of financial position had negative UMI. That's correct. Uh, which means that he had no capacity to make the loan repayments. Uh, not that he had no capacity, that he would, um, uh, there might be hardship involved. Um, uh, or additionally would need to adjust other items of expense. Well, doesn't negative UMI mean that there's nothing left to payments? Uh, no, because that's still sensitised. Within the UMI? Uh, within the UMI. So what should ordinarily happen if a hardship uh, team member um, assesses that someone now has negative UMI? Generally, hardship um, is appropriate for where there's been a change in circumstances for the borrower, mm -hmm. um, and that's of a short-term nature, um, in which case there's certain um, arrangements ANZ comes to with that customer to allow them to get through that difficult period until they can um, get back on their feet, per se. So whether it's um, uh, family members sick, they have to do reduced hours or indeed lose their jobs, etc. cetera, um, their arrangements can go into the customer until they either find employment, et cetera, and they're back. Um, to where they were before, uh, yeah, that's the type of process. But on this occasion, nothing like that was offered to Mr Regan because, firstly, no one had worked out that he had a negative <coughs> UM because the uh, person who filled out the form for ANZ got it wrong. That's correct. Uh, and he was therefore contacted in June, on the 20th of June last year, and told that his application for hardship assistance had been declined on the basis that he could maintain his current scheduled payments without needing any variation. That's correct. Uh, and, and do you stand by that decision? Uh, no, not at all. Um, Mr Regan then sought the assistance of um, a community legal service uh, to engage with ANZ on his behalf, is that right? Uh, I think it was Financial Counselling Australia first. Yes. yes. Is, is that a community legal service? Oh, well, that's a good question. So at least a financial counsellor and yes. subsequently a community legal service. Is uh, that right? Calc, yes. yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, and in response to um, correspondence from them, ANZ gave Mr Regan uh, a credit assessment statement. Is that right? Uh, sorry. Oh, calc, oh. calc gave... No, I'm sorry. ANZ gave Mr Regan's representatives a document called a credit assessment statement which you've annexed to your oh, yes. Sorry, statement. Yes, yes. It's WAR 18 at ANZ 800 and the that's the covering letter if we could have the following two pages brought up on the screen together We'll see there, and I assume you're familiar with this document, uh, yes. Mr Rankin. We'll see there that on the 2nd of February this year, ANZ told Mr Regan that it had assessed his loan as being not unsuitable uh, and that it had concluded that he was able to meet his financial obligations without substantial hardship. Yeah, it's, 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 my understanding is that, that that's referencing at the point in time that it was approved. Yes, I see. Yes, so yes. This, is, this is a document that ANZ is required to provide under the National Credit Act, is it not? If a consumer requests a document explaining the assessment that's been undertaken as to whether the loan is suitable for them or not, they're entitled to receive one. And this was a request by Mr Regan's representatives for such a document, and it was provided. Yep. Yes, and it was provided in February of yes. this year. Yep. Uh, now, ANZ was provided with a copy of Mr Regan's statement to this commission on the 8th of March this year. Uh, do, I have, 
Do I have that? Uh, Mr Regan's statement is dated 8 March. It's in evidence oh, and it, sorry, it can yes, be okay. shown. Uh, do you accept that ANZ received a copy of that statement yes, from sorry, the Royal we did. Commission? Sorry, I you're in the, I'm sorry in to the, have confused <laughs> that's you. That's okay. I thought you were in the um, train of events. Yes. Yes. So uh, I am in the chain of events. So having provided this credit assessment statement to Mr Regan's representatives on the 2nd of February this year, on the 8th of March this year, uh, ANZ was told by the Royal Commission that Mr Regan would be giving evidence and provided with a copy of Mr Regan's statement. Yes. And on the 9th of March this year, uh, the day after receiving Mr Regan's uh, witness statement, Mr Scott Clark from ANZ uh, notified Mr Regan's representatives that ANZ would provide a three-month moratorium on his repayments. Is that right? Uh, yes. I can have that document brought up to assist oh, you, Mr I can Rankin. take your word for it. I've, I've seen uh, a document of that in nature, yeah. Yes. For the record, that's RCD 0014-0002-0001. So that was the day after ANZ received the statement. And then on the 15th of March 2018, the day before Mr Regan gave evidence, ANZ provided RCD 0014-0002-0002, a letter dated 15 March 2018, uh, to Mr Regan's representatives. Is that correct, yes. Mr Rankin? Thank you, Mr Rankin. Those documents are both in evidence, Commissioner, already. I have no further questions. Yes, thank you. Does any party other than ANZ who has leave to appear seek to cross-examine this witness? Well, Dr Collins? Uh, there's nothing arising. Might Mr Rankin be excused? Uh, well, Ms Orr, no. Mr Rankin, just before you leave the witness box, I want to give you one last opportunity. Do you stand by the decision to make the loan to Mr Regan? Um, with the information um, that we had available at the time and applying the policies and procedures that we apply for those types of loans at the time, it was in accordance with our policies and procedures. Well, the answer is either yes or no. I take that as a positive answer. That is that you stand by that decision. I want to give you this last chance. Do you stand by that decision? Uh, in hindsight, uh, it's, it's hard to um, have that you know, make that clear delineation. Um, at the time, with the same, with the same um, information available to us, the same decision would be made. Yes. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, that concludes the evidence in relation to home loans in this part of the hearings. The next topic is add-on insurance and the first witness um, will be responded to by um, barristers from a different entity, so if the Commissioner wouldn't mind a brief break. If I come back at, what, 20 to midday or... Yes, I think that should be 20 sufficient. To midday. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, very well.